Hello, everyone. This is To Debate, your debating podcast. And today, as usual, I have my co-host, who is in a very good mood because it's almost springtime. I, I guess that's the reason why you're in a good mood, no? Dirk is your co-host today, and I'm Sebastian. How are you? I'm doing very well, and I enjoy the springtime, although I have to say it's too warm for this time of the year. So after this little uh, weather interlude, uh, uh, Grandpa Dirk, let's uh, focus on our uh, hey, I've lost uh, focus. debating I've possible. lost focus because you could argue that uh, the, the shift of the seasons is due to global warming. What a coincidence. What about we debate today <laughs> about global warming? <laughs> and actually, it's very spot on. You know why? It's because every time we have a recording, since to do this recording, we need equipment um, like microphones and software to record stuff you always pride yourself in showing to me the latest gear that you've bought you're just a role model of what capitalism is all about you just love shopping you just like you know these products and consuming and consuming more stuff which you don't need all this stuff but you just love it isn't that true that's very true and uh, now that we so artfully brought together the two elements of our motion. Shall we tell our <laughs> listeners what we want to debate today? I like how you don't get you don't you don't give a damn about what, all the random <laughs> BS I just mentioned. Yes, exactly. Global warming and capitalism are the two components of the motion today. We will debate on whether capitalism and solving global warming are compatible or not. The motion is they are incompatible. The flip of the coin, because this is the way we do it, means I will be in favor of that motion. I will show how capitalism cannot solve global warming, whereas, Dirk, you will try to show that it's totally fine. There's nothing, there's nothing incompatible between shopping for more electronic gear and actually the Earth getting warmer. We can actually solve that problem. Yes. Uh, I, guess, I guess the hypothesis that we have here, or it's not a hypothesis, but we're not at least considering the fact that global warming is happening or not, because apart from a few idiots, everyone is perfectly perfectly aware that there is something called global warming, which is the product of of, hum of the human being. Yeah, that impact my understanding. On the my understanding is that most of the idiots, as you call them, actually dispute the latter. Right. So people are in general agreement that there is global warming. The yes. thing they are not in agreement about whether it's man made. And whether we oh, as, just a natural cycle. Yeah, and whether we can do anything about it. I think about the latter you can really dis debate on and be in disagreement because, you know, a species that cannot figure out how to solve for, I don't know, health insurance issues, but then believe we can figure out a global threat like global warming, that is something you can have a debate over. But that's not our debate today. Our debate today is whether or not capitalism may be a good vehicle or not. So this this topic, this motion was something I was suggesting to us both. And this was the result of an uh, interview I saw for an astrophysicist, French astrophysicist, who was discussing various things about science. And it just struck me how, how clear his speech was. I'll find the, the name again, and maybe we can add this in the notes. So, and, I th and actually doing a little bit of research for today's debate made me realize how there's actually a lot of conversation around this topic about whether a capitalism as we know it today, as we have been running our society in most parts of the planet for the past century or so is actually a compatible model system or not to try and solve one of the biggest issues that humankind is going to be facing or is already facing because global warming is happening. It's just to what extent are we going to do something about it or are we just going to let the, the planet dry out, I guess. Now that we are on such a positive note, let's then just go ahead with the debate. I'm against Let's the motion. Ahead. I say capitalism can solve global warming, and I'm going first. Okay, let's do this. Dirk goes first and argues against the motion. Capitalism, the dominant system. Even the Chinese have some form of capitalism, whether you believe it or not. And in capitalistic countries, it's Interestingly, the big corporation these days and not the governments or any non-governmental organization that are leading the charge to fight climate change today. So if you today look for agencies, for groups of people 
for institutions that fight climate change, it's the corporations that you find. Google is a good example. We are powering our data centers with green energy since early 2000s. Tesla kicked off the, char uh, the change to electric cars and all major car makers now follow the, that lead. And why is that? Because it is good business and it becomes better business with every natural disaster we see cynically. Markets are governed by supply and demand and there was never more demand for solutions that fight climate change than these days. Hence the speed it will pick up. Prices for green energy and CO2 neutral technologies are dropping at a massive rate right now. So much so that countries like India, who are not among the wealthiest, take steps and plan radical measures to move to clean energy alternatives and new traffic concepts. So um, at the core, there is a key observation uh, that will form the main part of my arguments I will lay out later as well. In capitalism, it is a matter of cost and profits. The more people care about wasting our natural resources or not wasting it, and the more care about a degrading biodiversity, the higher the cost for companies that continue exploiting it. Therefore, there is a market created, which is exploited by capitalism. Therefore, we will solve for global warming, I have no doubts about that, by mechanisms of capitalism. Governments can speed this up, because I will agree with you that it's not fast enough and maybe there is a bit of a race going on so it's going to be a heartbeat finale in the end by for instance putting taxes on resources or something similar but the innovation inducing drive of capitalism is what will win the day in the end now it's sebastian's turn let's hear his argument we human beings are selfish we're selfish and evolution makes us want to maximize our use of resources, of consuming the Earth's resources. And this is why, by essence, capitalism means growth, economic growth, growth which means using more and more resources to generate more output. It's, there's no other equation about capitalism. And already, if we do nothing right now, the planet is going to get warmer because of us. If we use even more resources to justify that growth, it's going to be even more dramatic. We produce, and this is the way it's been going on for decades, we produce for profit, not for sustainability. Polluters never really pay, whether even if there's taxes, they never really pay for the full damage. Profits are privatized, but pollution is paid by everyone, by all the taxpayers. There's no other solution, unfortunately, but to, not only to stop growth, but also to reduce the size of our economy. If we continue just producing what we produce today on the planet, the earth is going bankrupt in terms of resources. So we have to reduce the size of the economy. Nobody will accept it, especially not rising nations like China and India, which you've mentioned. So I'm actually very pessimistic because we need a systemic change that no one is really ready to accept. And the use of green recycled bags and electric cars and all, all you want will never be enough. It's an illusion that hides the real problem at cause. Likewise, if you only blame factories or planes or agriculture for pollution, is ignoring that we want all these products as consumers. Capitalism encourages consumption. US capitalism, to mention the USA, is riddled with subsidies for fossil fuels. And of course, there's very, very strong lobbies who will use all their influence to protect the value of their fossil fuel assets. In conclusion, for my little introduction here, even people who don't believe in climate change, even those people, claim that those who claim there is climate change and it's being produced by humans, that it's just a covert attack on capitalism. They think it's a socialist hoax or a Chinese hoax, right? This is just to show the extent that indeed it's a systemic problem and that capitalism and solving global warming I just do not go hand in hand. And now on to Dirk. Let's hear his rebuttal. Global warming is caused by a number of factors we understand better and better. Actually, some would argue quite well by now. The use of the overuse, you might say, of fossil fuels, the industrialized production of meat and beef at an unbelievable scale, some unfortunate processes that we introduced before we actually realized the consequences. All that is true. All that is accelerating. All that is, is a problem, a challenge, a big, big challenge. And yes, as long as the fossil fuels are cheaper than the alternatives, 
especially upcoming countries will turn to that. You're right. But what is the force that lowers prices for desirable solutions? That's capitalism. The prices for green energy, as I mentioned earlier, they didn't drop just a little bit. They dramatically fall year over year. Energy sources like wind energy, solar energy, water energy, all these energy sources were revolutionized in the past three decades. In the, precisely the time frame, we allowed ourselves to really think about the consequences of climate change. And the forces that lowered those prices were not governments, were not insights or anything. It was capitalism. Because capitalism, and that is the beauty of it, it works because everybody is selfish. Because everybody acts in their self-interest. That's the whole point of capitalism. And the self-interest these days becomes more and more obviously uh, what you do, what you do um, to protect the environment because the environment is fading away. And we can watch it. When I said... Right now, it's warm outside for this time of the year. Yes, in our in our part of the world, this is even nice. There are other parts of the world where when it's warm for this time of the year, that means they don't know how to feed their families, which in turn puts pressure on the Western world because that means we have refugees and everything. All these mechanisms are well understood and they introduce the costs that you are missing. They put a price tag on uh, actors in the economy and that price tag even though it's not an immediate price tag on the fossil fuel or on the natural resources but the price tag on the consequences will lead to changes and there are technical changes for the co2 concentration in the air there are tech uh, technical changes for uh for uh, global warming and i have no doubts that we as humankind have the creative and economical abilities to turn this around it will take a massive undertaking, but in the end, it's going to be capitalistic forces that will drive this. Sebastian, let's hear it. Let me address some of the points that you've raised, and then I'll continue with an example or a counterexample. You mentioned that um, corporations, for corporations, that it's good business for them to tackle global warming. Even if that were true, overall, nothing is changing. Overall, the temperatures are rising. Overall, we're still using more and more resources. Overall, as a planet, as 7 billion people living on it, we're still using more resources than we ever did. So for all the tech progress you're mentioning, or say may happen one day, nothing has materialized now. And it's already too late. It is already too late. The ice at the poles is melting. The icebergs are breaking apart from the uh, Arctic poles, and this is happening. And where is the tech progress? Yes, we're doing some tech progress, but it's barely anything. It doesn't have any impact. I think there is a small confusion in what you said also between weather and climate. It's not because it gets a bit warmer now that necessity this is global warming, but fair enough, you mentioned how other parts of the world may be adversely affected. So you mentioned the price tag, and that's an interesting aspect. That I did not mention the cost aspect indeed. And the reason I did not is because I had an example which initially I thought you would use against me, and that's Sweden. But then I looked into it. Uh, it was a thesis around it, a very detailed analysis that I read. And then I thought, well, how can I counter this? And here's the following story. Swedish uh, per capita emissions are about as low as they were in 1950. They're, they're, they actually tripled their emissions per capita and then started decreasing it uh, to be at about one ton annually per person. It's actually 1.25. The U.S. is four tons, by the way, per capita, and it's in line with global average. But here's the thing. Sweden has decreased so much, it's back to global average, which is too much for the planet. So, people, And Sweden, if anything, is not really the most capitalist country on the planet, right? It has high taxes. It's a welfare state. Uh, it's almost overprotects its citizens. So my case about saying capitalism is not compatible actually goes well in line with Sweden, by the way. In Sweden, you have nuclear power. And it's funny that you talk about the price tag because nuclear power provides low carbon electricity, right? But do we take into account the price of extracting uranium, which is not particularly environmentally friendly, or the dismantling of the nuclear power plants? No, we do not. Not today. Not yet. Not even in the EU. So that's it's the, complex, the problem is way more complex than we think it is. So arriving at a solution for global warming, let me just provide just a few elements of what I think we need to do. And these few things will show you how it's really not compatible with the way our economic system is being built. 
One is we will need to rein in corporations. We'll need to, to put safeguards and prevent them from growing, probably prevent them from growing in the Western world, allow them to grow in emerging countries because we will not be allowed, we will not be able to prevent China and India to, to grow. It's just logical. They would want to have a, a higher level, level of, of standard of living. We need to relocalize production. It's crazy to think I can ship things cheaper from China today, get them through air or boat, and it's cheaper than just to buy it next door. Like I was in New Zealand over Christmas, and New Zealand is a known country for producing kiwis. Do you know where the kiwis came from in the supermarket? Italy. I am not joking. Italy is one of the biggest producers of kiwis, and New Zealand, which produced kiwis, was importing them to New Zealand in the supermarket. It makes no sense. No sense. Another aspect that we need to change and the cult of shopping. Companies would have to contract and we need to tax the rich and the filthy. It's as simple as that and it's not compatible with capitalism. Final statements. Dirk goes first. Last year, there has been a Nobel Prize. Two economists, I have to say, who won that Nobel Prize for their work on the influence on taxing and capitalism on global warming. And they said what you need in order to win the day is a tax on resource consumption. But they also say that it is not an economical or a capitalism problem. It is a political problem of building consensus we would make huge strides by taxing resources like, for instance, the environmental damage you take by taking uranium out of the ground for using fossil fuels. And they've won a Nobel Prize on it, basically making all the recommendations. And it is on us to understand that, vote accordingly and figure this out. But it is capitalism that will make it work. Sebastian. If we continue shopping at the same pace, we're already in big, big trouble. Let me put forward this very simple equation. Capitalism equals growth, equals use of more resources on this planet, equals even more problems. We want to have less problems? That equals using less resources, which equals less growth, which means no growth, which means negative growth, which means nothing like capitalism. We need to reinvent the way we run the economy. And it's not easy, and we're not going to accept it. So I'm actually very pessimistic. For this debate, I think it's incompatible. In real life, I think we're not going to change anything, and we're in deep trouble, to not use another swear word. Well, we end up on a very pessimistic note. Where is your optimism? You want to live forever and you don't believe in humankind. That's, that's, it's, uh, this is really uh, depressive. I want to live forever. I'm not sure I, I will, but, um, the last Sebastian on the planet reading all the books well, I, there are that hey, are left. Uh, <laughs> and like you, I don't have children. And <laughs> it's true that part of my pessimism is counted by the fact that I'm not leaving anyone else behind me. I have nephews, so it's not exactly the same thing. I do care about the, the future of the planet, but in a way I don't care because I'm not going to live long enough to suffer from the consequences, which I think is what, ha what's ha what's I, th I think is the behavior of most people today. Like at least the lobbies and the politicians, they think, oh, and my children will not suffer from it immediately. It's maybe two generations down the line. So it's just so far away that we don't really care. Yeah. So so there are, there are two things that you really have at the core of your argument, right? So one is, and to that I actually agree, um, that uh, a constant drive for growth, 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 growth will eventually kill whatever resources you have available. And capitalism, how, how it's understood in the Western world, is that endless drive for growth, 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 growth. The, the other thing you say is, and that's the other, other assumption, people are incapable, unwilling or not interested in change because it's personally inconvenient. And I do feel both of these arguments are, are can be disputed. For instance, for the personal change of people, you have a movement that's called minimalism right now. That's actually contradicting uh, um, capitalism at its core. So you have people that uh, that kind of start uh, throwing out their stuff, not buying anything anymore. You have the whole fair use and uh, and reuse movement. So they are too small in comparison. I'm with you on that. But they are growing movements. 
and you have whole 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 societies like the one in uh, like like China that are driven from a central authoritarian regime given granted but they are also leading the charge so i would say as humans we are capable of making the switch the question is whether or not we are fast enough to realize it and there is not a there, it's not a natural law that we always keep growing 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 because uh, it's also if the rise of the machines you know if we if we if we replace our jobs by machines at some point it also becomes pretty stupid to keep growing 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 so we will hit a glass ceiling and capping it and uh, at some point anyway and maybe that will change too so a few things to to what you said um question rhetorical question almost you know for every one new minimalism adept how many hundreds or hundreds of thousands of new indian indian middle class families aspire to owning a car and a house and a garden and a dog and whatever right so the trend is not going in the right direction overall i'm not pessimistic the planet will figure it out if we even destroy <laughs> our planet no it's true yeah. we destroy our planet even with nuclear weapons over the course of the next millions of years life will start again probably maybe not human beings but on the course of the, like it's billions of years we have until the sun becomes this whatever giant red whatever asshole whatever that uh, that uh, <laughs> that planet killing asshole <laughs> basically basically <laughs> but my, my point on the very, on extremely long term like life will and nature will take over yeah that's not the problem the thing is like it's before that can we just avoid being just so stupid as just kill everything and kill ourselves and i and and maybe in between those two things it's what it's your point is that we may adjust ourselves automatically with machines maybe by realizing and, and the trend is having less and less children we will cap i think the population will, will be capped at around 12 billion people in 2050 and then we'll start declining uh because of various age, age pyramids so maybe this will help but in the meantime it's going to be dramatic for millions of people like you're, you're going to have millions maybe billions of people who are going to suffer right if anything that, that we've understood in the past few decades with religion or humanism is that after all we're on this planet to make ourselves you know, feel a bit happy and minimize pain for ourselves and others mm -hmm. right and this pain is going to be endured by millions and billions of people right so it's not you know, i don't want to say it's not nice because it sounds very naive but the point is it is going to be dramatic for a lot of people it's not going to be dramatic for us in germany or france or europe for, for the most part but there's billions of people who are going to suffer so how do we avoid that? And I don't think we're going to be able to avoid it. Today, famine is not a problem, for instance. People have enough food. The problem is obesity. Right? People have too much food or too much junk food. Right? So it's interesting to see how people die almost, almost don't die anymore from war or from famine or from diseases. We've solved most of the big problems, these problems from the past decades and centuries. And now we have this massive problem of global warming, which seems at the same time very abstract because we don't feel it every day. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about it. And we say, hey, take a shower instead of a bath. But seriously, this is not changing anything. Anyway, um, for me, it was new to, to research this topic, to be honest, about capitalism. I did not give it give it enough thought before. I didn't realize to what extent it was actually so damaging. Yeah. And how our current mode of of operating was, was so destructive. And that's why I looked into the counter example of Sweden. And I looked into the thesis document, which was fairly long and very well documented. And I thought, well, actually, it does not make the point of of capitalism it shows the reverse in my opinion and even if it's at the global average as i said in the in our in our little debate I, it's not good the trend is still not good i mean thank you swedish people for being so good at triple glazing your windows and and being so efficient and having nuclear power plants instead of coal uh, factories but still it's still not good enough sorry guys mm -hmm. yeah um i and that and that observation i agree by the way our particular brand of capitalism kills us so if we continue doing what we're doing it's not moving fast enough and in the end the result will be damaging um and yes we will figure it out it will not even kill humankind um as you, as you said you don't like, think so hmm? you don't think so no i don't think so um i i think it will cause wars we will be at each other's throat uh, we will have places on this planet where no one lives anymore all this will happen and um, huge changes but in the end um we will have a smaller but still existing society 
and the planet will still be there. Um, I don't think that we are safe in the sense of, hey, no problem in France, in Germany or in the US, because these are the countries where all those uh, refugees that we uh, that we wasted their, uh, after we wasted their countries will come to. So, uh, yeah, it was... Um, it. Uh, so in that I agree, and an endless growth uh, is is a problem. I do think You're right. I, it's the yeah. forces in the end uh, of capitalism, though, that will tr turn that around. But probably a little bit too late to be without pain. Do do you, uh, I'm I'm just curious as a as a, as a German, and this is a bit of a stereotype, but are you particularly sensitive to these aspects of the environment and global warming? Or or is it just one of the topics that that are just in the news and you read and and. I am. I'm not sure if I'm particularly sensitive. I am sensitive to it in the sense that I feel guilty for contributing to it. Also, um, feeling guilty for feeling selfish about it. So whenever, whenever I, you know, when I have a nice steak in front of me and I dig in, I am aware that I'm actually doing the opposite of what would be the right thing because uh, little things damage the planet as much as industrialized beef production, for instance. So uh, all these things kind of contribute and I'm in a paradoxical state. It's like boarding a plane knowing that this is maybe not the right um, way to save the planet goes in the right direction. I'm traveling a lot. So the, if you calculate this, uh, it's it's sitting on my conscience. So I am i don't think that I'm particularly German sensitive to it, but I'm as sensitive as every thinking being should be. And I try to have... I try to to find consequences and uh, do things that uh, that steer me in the right direction. But as you said, I'm probably Sweden in the end. So I uh, like coming back to average, but not nearly far enough. Um, I think I'm very similar to you. I'm just curious because Germans are known to be particularly good and on the forefront of recyc recycling and, and caring about these aspects. So that's why I was curious about your personal perspective. You mentioned meat. Uh, I'll just give one stat. For every kilogram of slaughtered meat, it takes 20,000 liters of water. 20,000 liters for one kilo. Yes. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's the, the meat industry is probably the most uh, resource intensive yeah. uh, in terms of earth resources of any industry, even compared to the, the transportation industry. Uh, that I did not know, I actually just discovered a few weeks ago. Uh, anyway, fascinating. Thanks for debating. Thank you. As always, and our listeners, thank you to you for listening. If you have any remarks or if you'd like to vote, head to our website, todebate.eu, and stay tuned for our next debate. We have a lot more coming in. Thanks for listening, and um, I do it. I almost like to say talk to you next time, but we're not talking to our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> not just yet. But we have, we have our loyal listeners, so thank you to you, and thank you to you uh, once more for debating. It was my pleasure and um, yeah, uh, look forward to the next one. Bye-bye. Cheers, bye-bye.